today we're starting right off with what's the most basic, what's the most important, how can we tell what's going on. Okay, so we start out with a shape. And the shape node, as it turns out, is not even a piece of geometry itself. The shape is a container that collects the other nodes. And there are important reasons for why we have that. The specific nodes we're going to look at then for how to draw things, how to, how to make 3D objects, will be the, the five primitives you see there, box, cone, cylinder, sphere, and text. We call them primitives because they're, they're not necessarily simple uh, polygonally, simple under the hoods, but they're simply defined. They are, uh, in most cases, platonic solids. They are the primitive basics that, gee, if you have these, you can put a lot of stuff together, and they don't require a lot of work. One last note in there is font style, which lets us change, you guessed it, the font and the style of rendering of the text node. So it's a modifier node. Okay. We'll also look at the tool tips and the specification, not to make you guys uh, super experts on the first pass, but rather to give you resources that as you study, as you go, as you encounter questions, you know where to look and where to find stuff out. Primary reference. Well, I got to say it, the, the textbook. That's where we uh, invested immense amounts of time to try to answer every question, anticipate them, and also the slides. Then I'd say the tooltips and the uh, spec is your last resort, X3D specification. Okay, so what are the common concepts for primitive geometry? First is, as we mentioned, is the shape node. So what does it do? It can contain a geometry node, and it can contain an appearance node. So the idea here is that for any chunk of geometry you have, you want to say, what does it look like? What color is it? Is it shiny? Is it transparent? Does it glow in the dark? Is it black? Is it white? Is it something that has a texture wrapped around it, a picture image that makes it look more real, like something else? These are all different ways of doing appearance. For this chapter, we're going to keep it dirt simple. We're going to use color, color in the material node. And we'll focus just on the geometry. We look ahead at appearance in the next chapter. That's when we'll drill down. Now, uh, here's a point of information for you. When you first come across this, it often seems, my goodness, why did they structure things this way. How come I always have to have a color, an appearance, a material, some kind of rendering direction next to each and every shape? Why can't I just put a bunch of shapes out there and just say, well, I'll make them all the same color? Wouldn't that be easier to describe? Very good idea. Here's why we don't on the first pass. There's a, a two-part answer. We don't, and the second part is, oh, but you can't. There's a way around. The reason we don't is not to make your life miserable as an author. The reason sentences have a period at the end is because there's a subject and a verb, a predicate, and the period says, oh, we're done. Here it is. You can sort of think of the shape, geometry, appearance material as that's an atomic form. That's a, a construct over and over again that makes sense. Second reason we do it, that's how the hardware does it. It turns out, in most cases, when you're sending polygons down to the, the hardware to draw on the screen, it wants to know, OK, you told me where to go. Now tell me what color, how shiny, how transparent. Get, give me some more information. So since the hardware has to render that way, we put them right together. Of course, whenever I use the word hardware, graphics hardware, we're talking about performance. How do we make it fast, real time, faster than real time, so fast that you don't care how fast it is. OK, so this is the pattern. And even though we have four chapters on geometry, every time you learn a new geometry node, it's just about, well, what does that geometry look like? What is, what is the form? How did I define that? OK, all done. 
because it gets thrown into the scene graph in the exact same place. Okay, so this pattern we're learning in this chapter is fabulous because we use it over and over again. So uh, here are the primitives, this time not listed by name, but listed by what do they look like? Screen snapshot. And so you go, oh, okay, how do we make that picture? How do we decide? Well, let's make it. Let's jump out to the slides and pull it up. Okay, so uh, Chris, uh, in the in the minutes, uh, that, this would be a good time to say, well, we're on slide seven, and we're going to go to that example. And if you have the slides, if you're following along with the slides on your machine, here's another trick. If we go to handout mode, excuse me. I always mess that up. If we go to notes mode on slide seven, here are the notes. Okay, let's zoom this up a little bit for the for the display. We see the notes for this are pretty much saying what I'm saying, but they also give a link to the scene itself. So if I click on that link, boom presto. Here comes the scene. And it's in my browser, and I can rotate it and spin it around. And we go, oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, so how did we do it? Well, we wrote a scene. That's how, and then we took the picture. OK, so how do you do it? Well, you can follow that step from the notes. Or, better yet, we go to, see if I can find it here. we open it up. So if you go on your local machine, you should find uh, X3D for web authors. Installed in uh, the same directory actually that matches the website. In fact, let me go there and put it on the screen like that. Uh, I'm going to use my, my Windows uh, File Explorer and go to the directory and see if I can get this stuff out of the way here so we can get it properly on the screen. Here we go. Ah, what happened here? Where'd my uh, Who knows how to get the uh, menu back on top? I seem to have lost that. Did it get dragged over the side here or what? I'm trying to find the directory structure. Does everybody see what I'm talking about? What's missing right now is the directory we're in. Somehow I've misclicked or it's gotten uh, mixed up. The address right here. They're not responding so well. Maybe this will show it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, Jeff, that's a good candidate to cut there, a minute of fumbling. So we will have a cut. OK, so if we look at the directory structure, we can see here it is installed in directory web3d.org, x3d content examples, x3d for web authors, and then, oh, chapter two, geometry primitives. And now we need to find the scene. What was the scene? Well, we can look back at the link on the website and say, Oh yeah, the same directory structure, and then geometry primitive nodes is our file name. So let's find that, geometry primitive nodes. Please do be careful to get just the uh, X3D version. You don't want the X3DB or X3DB or HTML. Those are alternate versions. You just want the X3D. Okay, so 
when I open that. Take just a second and then we should see the example. Okay, so I'm going to stretch this out a little bit. And Chris, this is a good thing to do in the uh, chat channel. You'll notice that in each example we have an identifier tag that lists what's the URL. So this is another reinforcement for people uh, where I can just paste in the URL and there it is in the chat channel. And so that makes it also easy for people remotely to keep up and people after the fact to say, oh, what did we do? Which example did we follow? Okay, so uh, the right window. <laughs> okay, and we can also see some extra pros here. So that's also a good resource for you uh, when you're studying or when we're listening and just in record mode, you can go to the notes and say, oh, maybe my question is answered there. Okay, so uh, there's actually a gotcha that's in there. How good is my quality? How many polygons might we have? Okay, so to follow that question, let's look at this scene. We have this geometry primitive nodes, and here it is in my built-in XJ3D browser. Okay, so we can see that we have four geometric solids and then text. Let's open this window up a little bit. I'm going to undock it. I just clicked on the top bar of the XJ3D window. Select undock. There's also a hotkey. Here it is. If XJ3D is not cooperating, we'll just go back to the main window and refresh it or restart it until you get something. Okay, here we go. Now there's an interesting... Yes, we can hear you, William. Hello? We're going to keep going. We're in uh, presentation mode, all right? Okay, so if we look at this example, there's an interesting hotkey, and it's, uh, let's see if I get this right. Alt-Shift-W. You have the window highlighted, it should stay on top. When I went Alt Shift W, that's the keyword for wireframe. Okay, so we have the same exact display, but not colored in anymore. We're just seeing the wire boxes for each of these things. And the closer we get to it, the more closely we look, we see, oh, guess what? Everything is a triangle. Astro Glasgow. I've joined. Okay, uh, so even the text. So let's look at a little more closely at that. I'm clicking on the different navigation buttons here on the left, which control how my mouse is moving. So by looking at the arrow key, that takes us from examine mode, which rotated, to fly mode, which lets us go forward and backwards. So we can see that, yes, indeed. Everywhere we look, another triangle. Okay, so this is an important lesson under the hood about just about everything we're going to draw. At the end of the day, under the hood, it's triangles. It's polygonal in nature. Occasionally, you'll get higher order polygons, quadrilaterals, maybe even uh, multi sided polygons. But in general, graphics cards don't like that because it's easy to define polygons that are illegal or ill-defined or undrawable. So the nicest part about a triangle from a graphics hardware point of view is there's only one way to do it. It will always be planar, it's not ambiguous. So that's why we tend to decimate whatever shape it is right back down to triangles. So if I hit my hotkey again, Alt-Shift-W, we go, oh, there it is. It's all smooth and nicely rendered where it's coloring in the gaps between the triangles. But if we look very closely, those triangles are still there. 
So if I get up right next to the edge of this sphere, you can see there are some differences. In fact, uh, uh, this won't affect the recording, but Ken, could you please hit the lights, uh, the middle light and probably the uh, left light, and that shows you guys the contrast a little better. And so if we look very hard there, you can see the edges of where those polygons are. If you want to confirm that, we go Alt-Shift-W again, and sure enough, there are the edges. But there are enough triangles here that it's very subtle, and you can't really tell, from a distance anyway, whether or not it's smooth. Okay, right now when I go back to examine mode, start rotating around and we see that, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty round, pretty spherical, looking good. Same with the cylinder and the cone and so forth. Okay, so let's redock this window. Right click on the top, on the gray part of the top, or let's just redock, put it back where it belongs, I'll shift it click the home key, which takes us back to the original home viewpoint. We say, okay, there's our scene. From a 3D perspective, I understand it. It makes sense. Let's look at the scene itself now. So we'll skip the metadata. I'll just hide that here by iconizing it. And let's take a look at the scene itself. And so what do we have? We have a shape, a box, appearance, material. Let's highlight those lines. So we say, oh, wait a minute, that's the same pattern we had on our slide. Shape contains some geometry and an appearance, which, oh, by the way, then would be where you put your material. So if we look at this scene, we'll see this pattern over and over and over again. Shape, cylinder, appearance, material. Shape, cylinder, appearance, material. If you don't want to look at the text, if that's a little hard, okay, well, let's go over here to the tree view and open it up. And under each transform, we see shape, geometry, appearance, material. Shape, geometry, appearance, material. So each one of these guys is done the same. You can also see that this tree view is a nice shortcut to finding the piece of your scene that you want. Because as I click on the left, the cursor jumps on the right to take me where I want to go. Yes, Ken, questions? So you mentioned earlier, like, as far as the material, how it's kind of like setting up the shape. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible to do just a material block and have it apply to all those things? Or, or? Answer, yes. And what we do is we make one copy of the node. The question is, can we just use one material for everything? And the answer is yes. We use a construct called def and use, where we define a name for it, and then we can reuse it over and over again. So thank you for asking, because that's the answer to the original question. Well, yeah, we have to repeat it all the time, but what's the workaround? The workaround is def use. That's how we make copies. But your, your sentence, your sentence structure would change. Have. Correct. Your scene structure would still be the same. Even with def use, you would still have a shape, geometry, appearance, material. But some would be copies rather than the original. So we will see that. Okay, so we have this basic structure, this fundamental pattern. We're seeing it over and over. And uh, we also see, as a look ahead, for uh, chapter four, we have a thing called a transform, which trans transformation, it translates it, it moves these things side to side. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that our box got moved five meters to the left, our cone got moved two and a half meters to the left, the cylinder's right in the middle at zero, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry about that for now. That's a little extra stuff. I'll just point it out to you so you see what's going on and you go, oh, well, we've got a pretty complicated shape. And the translation in the transform moved them off center so they don't all end up at one spot. So transforms are help helpful that way. And uh, 
why, uh, why do we do that? Well, it's sort of like time. You know, the definition of time is the thing that keeps everything from happening all at once. Okay, so we'll take a break for a question. Yeah. These are all built-in uh, shapes. So there, there's predefined algorithms that define a two, two, two mm -hmm. for a box. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, is it, is a user able to create different polynomials of Polygons yes, we do, have, we do have lots of different shapes, and you can create your own. Is the goal, though, for us to use the, the basic photonic shapes to, or, or I'm not really sure where Right now, we're just learning about the first ones. Okay, so we'll learn about the rest, how to do it. There's four whole chapters. Okay, now, now Ken, you weren't here yesterday. You'll see, did you get the uh, solos? Yeah, well, here's a hard copy for you. Thank you. Uh, believe you me, I love questions. But uh, what we're going to try to do is go through the material in one shot so Jeff doesn't have to sit here and try to edit in between every twist and turn of the dialogue. So I'll request that, uh, if, if at all possible, please hold the questions till the end or save them for the beginning or push him on the mail list if he gets squeezed out on the clock. And this will allow us to get the presentation port, part of the video just one solid chunk so that uh, we can do same day turnaround, hopefully. No, no problems. Okay, so picking back up here, we see that we've uh, reviewed this scene and what can we learn? from this then, looking at this guy. Well, we just went through uh, a bunch of concepts all at once, actually, on, on how this went. And so our driving question right then was, uh, how round is round? Rephrase, how many polygons go into my sphere? Or how many polygons go into a cylinder? answer whatever the browser decides. We don't expose that parameter to you. We've kept this very simple. So you get to say things like radius and height and width depending on the geometry. The number of polygons the browsers get to decide. In the olden days that was a big issue because browsers are always trying to save polygons so they can draw faster. However in modern times the graphics are so fast we don't care much anymore. So you'll find that mostly browsers just give you plenty and you don't have to worry about it. If you really want to get down into how many polygons made up that tessellation, that polygonization of the material, then you can make these in other ways in some of the advanced geometry nodes. Okay more common concepts. We've seen that all of this geometry so far has a very similar structure and a very similar way that it's used in the scene graph. Well, here's a, here's a common term they all have, and that's called solid. Solid is a field, and it decides whether or not a polygon is one-sided or two-sided, which is a curious concept. I mean, in, in real life, we don't have any one-sided polygons. But since these are mathematical constructs, since they're notional, it's quite possible to define a polygon that only has one side. And you might say, if you look at that on paper, you draw it out and say, well, that's pretty artificial. I mean, it has one side, but how do you tell? Answer, it only gets drawn on that one side. So if we flip it around, you won't see it because it does not get drawn by the rendering engine. So solid tells us whether or not it's there. And the, and the notion here on solid is uh, it's sort of like solid like a brick. Do you need to draw the inside of a brick? No, because you can't get in there. Or we don't, you know, usually people don't use bricks to visualize the inside of a brick. They say, well, it's no, I want to see the outside of a brick. I want to see the brick wall. I want to see what the bricks look like, not the inside. So solid says, okay, graphics engine, if you're solid, 
true, that means you can't get inside the brick. You don't have to draw the polygons on that side. Just draw the outside. And we cut our requirements in half. You only have to draw half of the graphics that we need to. Because if it's drawing stuff, even stuff you can't see, it still takes time for the computer to work through that and say, OK, I'm putting it here, here, here. Oh, but you can't see it anyway, so I'll throw it out. That just took time. So by only drawing the sides that are possible to be seen, you do it. OK? So solid is maybe counterintuitive. It might have been better if we used a, a word like uh, single-sided or two-sided, but we didn't mainly for legacy reasons, kept up with the, the common graphics terminology. So solid, true is the default. Let's say that again. Solid, true is the default. Wow, that's a, that's a dangerous statement, right? Why is that dangerous? Who can, who can tell me why that's dangerous? Solid, true is the default on all the geometry. Yes, sir. Bingo. We did a shark model one day, and we could only see the fins on one side. Why? Because solid was true. Doesn't sound like much until you find yourself on the wrong side of the polygon, and you don't go, oh my gosh, it's not drawn there. You go, where is it? Where'd it go? Where's my, where's my stuff? Did I lose it? Did I translate it over there? Is it the wrong color? OK, so the reason that's dangerous is because it makes things invisible if you're looking at it from the wrong side. So there's a good trick here right at the end. How do you avoid that confusion? When in doubt, set solid false. What the heck? Draw both sides. And that way you'll know, did I flip it inside out? Am I backwards? Am I on the wrong side? Or is it simply moved out of the way somewhere? OK, so here's our first gotcha and our first trick fix. Solid, false cures a number of bills. Okay, a little more. Here's an example of that. And it's right in the scene. If we rotate that scene, we got some snapshots here. The text is solid. So we don't see it. Solid true means only one-sided. And unfortunately, te text is not like a brick where you go, well, of course you don't draw the inside of a box. The text is flat. It's perfectly flat. So that means it's only drawing one side and not the other. The other side disappears. Let's look at the scene. Confirm that. Why take my word for it when we can just visualize it? So I'm spinning it around here. And we look. Oh, everybody see the text disappear there, so to speak? Here it is on one side. There it is missing on the other. Let's try our wireframe technique, Alt-Shift-W. And we can see that, my goodness, even the wireframe is one-sided. Isn't that beguiling? <laughs> OK, so solid false is the magic phrase to make it appear again. Show, I'll show this larger for the video so it's very clear. Uh, oh, we could also just double click on that window and if it survives, let's restart it here. Nope, it's not behaving today. Double click sometimes works to go full size, but my XJ3D is acting up. So instead, I'll simply restart it undock it again. If you find yourself doing a lot of undocking, you might want to remember the key. That's Alt-Shift-D. And, oops, make sure you have the right window selected when you do it. Reselecting the viewer, Alt-Shift-D. Restart. Open it up. Now I'm going to rotate the scene. Hello, X3D. Hello, X3D. Goodbye, text. It's invisible. Keep rotating, bring it back around. Oh, there it is again. How curious. OK. They're solid.
Okay. So that is the, the concept section for chapter two. Tomorrow when we pick up, we'll go into the individual notes.